I hope our series on the basic doctrines of the Christian faith has been helpful to you so far. This is a series of eight lessons that's designed to help you understand the fundamental truths that are at the very heart of what Christians believe. And it's important to get these basic truths down now so that as we grow in our faith, as you begin to learn more about uh, the faith that you have in Jesus Christ, you can build upon this solid foundation. Now, this is lesson six in our series. And in this section, we're going to deal with what happens after life here on this earth. You see, the time we spend here in this world is really only a short part of our existence. We all will spend eternity somewhere, and we would be wise to gain a better understanding of what that existence is going to be like. So let's begin. People have always had a sincere interest in the future. There is a universal and historical belief in life after death. Religious rituals and other evidence from around the world reveal that people do not believe death ends it all. Questions like, where are the dead? Is there a place of paradise? Is there a place of suffering? And what is it like? Are frequently asked. So let's understand, first of all, that man is a tripartite being. Now, that's a big word. It means that he exists in three parts. He is composed of body, soul, and spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 teaches us this. The first part is material being. That is the physical body. The other two are non-material. With a spirit, man is capable of God consciousness. With a soul, he is capable of self-consciousness. With a body, he is capable of world consciousness. According to Hebrews 4.12, only God's word can divide between the soul and the spirit. Now, at the time of death, the soul and the spirit leave the body which is put into the grave. Now, in the case of believers, the body is described as sleeping, as is the case with Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60. When he was stoned, it says that Stephen fell asleep. Chapter 8, verse 2 also in that context. Now, meanwhile, the, the unsaved person's body is spoken of as being dead. On the other hand, the soul and spirit never sleep. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, and Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, let us know that if the person who died was saved, the soul and the spirit go to a place of joy and happiness known as heaven. However, if the person who died was unsaved, their spirit and soul go to a place of sorrow and punishment known as hell. Furthermore, Jesus in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, clearly teaches through a story that he shared with his disciples that those who have died are conscious. So whenever you hear about this, this phrase called soul sleep, Understand, that is not biblically based, according to these passages that we've just referenced. So death is not soul sleep. The word in Scripture concerning death in Christ means rest. It does not mean unconsciousness. The body may die, but the soul and spirit are fully awake and will never die. Death in the Bible always means separation. That's what the word refers to. So physical death is separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. Spiritual death is eternal separation from God. To put it another way, we need to understand that we are not a body having a soul and spirit, but we are a soul and spirit possessing a body. Death simply means, I have left my body. That is to put it quite simply, what death is to leave the body, separation. Now, since we understand that the soul and spirit leave the body at death, it's natural to wonder if we will be without a body for all eternity. Well, the answer to that is no. The Bible speaks much about bodily resurrection. On different occasions, some in the Bible were raised from the dead. 
These were miraculous demonstrations of the power of God over death. But because they eventually died again, they were not bodily resurrected, but rather they were resuscitated back to life. Lazarus being raised from the dead is a good example of this, as recorded in John chapter 11, verses 39 through 44. The first example of death and bodily resurrection is our Lord, Jesus Christ. Christ, we are told, is the first fruit from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Now is Christ risen from the dead and becomes the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits in raising Christ from the dead was God's promise that the entire harvest will come later. The body of Christ, the true church, as we talked about last time, will have a bodily resurrection of its own. The dead in Christ shall rise first, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. This is the resurrection of the bodies of all who have died in Christ. They are united with their soul and spirit and will ascend into heaven in order to be the bride of Jesus Christ. This is what we call the rapture of the church, and we'll share more about this later. There were over 500 people who witnessed the appearances of Christ after his bodily resurrection. These eyewitnesses gave account that defy the denials of those who will not believe. In most courts, the most eyewitnesses that have been required are seven. The New Testament has records of documented testimonies from those who personally saw Jesus. Over 500 saw him in his resurrected body. Others who saw him testified that he was alive. They spoke with him. They ate with him, and they had a time of fellowship as he was with them for several times after bodily coming forth from a brutal crucifixion and three days in a guarded stone tomb. Besides all this, there is much clear evidence that Jesus Christ did, in fact, rise bodily from the dead. The 27 books of the New Testament and the church are the effects caused by the risen Christ. The church began immediately as the apostles began preaching in Jerusalem where he had been crucified and buried. 3,000 were saved in only one day when they began preaching on that day of Pentecost. They went everywhere telling that Jesus was alive from the dead. Believe me, if it were not true, those who opposed Jesus would have produced the body because it would have silenced all the claims of the early church. The fact is that three days after his crucifixion, he bodily rose from the grave. He is alive, and because he lives, we as Christians shall live also. Now, before we move on, let's take some time and consider some truths about heaven, the dwelling place of God and his people. The scriptures clearly teach that there is a place called heaven for all who know and love our Lord Jesus Christ. The word heaven is used in the Bible in three different ways. First of all, the region of the clouds is called heaven, like in Genesis 1-8. Then the area where the stars are located is known as heaven, as recorded in Genesis 1-17. Finally, the word is used to describe God's dwelling place. Paul calls this the third heaven and paradise in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 4. Now, heaven is always mentioned as being up. Satan said in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, I will ascend into heaven. We know that our Lord is in heaven today. After he was raised from the dead, he ascended in a body of flesh and bones. We see reference to this in Luke chapter 24, verses 38 and 39, and then also in verse 51. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, as well as Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. In addition, there is a great host of believers in heaven, for when the true Christian dies, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 tells us that he is absent from the body present with the Lord. These believers are enjoying the presence of Christ, 
which, as Paul proclaimed in Philippians 1.23, quote, is far better. Now, what is heaven like? Well, heaven is a place that God has prepared for all who come to him. If the creator of the universe prepared it, you know it must be something wonderful. Words would fail us to describe it adequately. The writers of scripture could not find language that would describe it. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 through 27, the Apostle John tries to describe the foundations, the wall, gates, the street of the heavenly city. We know from Revelation 21, verse 4, that there will be no sickness, no sorrow, no tears, no pain or death in that fair place. What we do know is that after the sorrow and suffering from the pains of life on this sin-cursed earth, we will be finally home. But best of all, the Lord Jesus Christ will be there, and he will be the supreme delight of every believer's heart. Now, what does the Bible say about hell? Well, we need to take a moment and consider the eternal state of those who are not believers in Christ, sometimes called the lost. As we've already noted, the spirit and soul of an unbeliever wing their flight to hell at the time of death. Hell is not a popular term today, but it is a Bible term. Hell is a place of conscious punishment. The soul in hell is spoken of as a person having eyes, ears, fingers, a tongue, even memory. There is full knowledge of the conditions there. Luke chapter 16, verses 23 through 25, describes this for us. Notice that this passage is not recording a parable of Jesus, because parables never include personal names of people. This is an actual event that the Lord Jesus relates to teach an important truth about what happens to the soul who does not receive Christ after death. The Bible speaks about another place of torment at the final judgment of all mankind. It's called the lake of fire. At the judgment of the great white throne, the souls in hell are going to be united with their bodies, which are to be raised from the graves. Christ will then pronounce the final sentence of judgment upon the wicked dead, and they will be cast into the lake of fire, the eternal dwelling place of the lost. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, refers to this. Hell may be likened to the local jail where the prisoner temporarily awaits his sentence. They are taken from the jail to appear before the judge for final sentencing. And then Revelation chapter 20, verses 9 through 15, describes the great white throne judgment of Satan and all who have rejected Christ and followed him. And the lake of fire can be likened to prison to which uh, are committed those under sentence for the duration of their eternal existence. So you have hell, which is a temporary dwelling place, which is followed by the lake of fire, the final dwelling place of all who reject Christ and rebel in their hearts against him. In describing hell in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48, our Lord speaks about the undying worm and the unquenchable fire. It is a place of conscious punishment. It is a place of literal fire. It is a punishment for sin eternally. There have been those who have glibly commented that they look forward to going to hell because that's where all their friends are going to be. And they think it's going to be one big party. Well, guess what? That's not what the Bible describes as hell. It is a place of conscious punishment, pain, and suffering, and the full knowledge of separation from God forever. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 11, the phrase forever and ever is used to describe the misery of the lost. Perhaps like many others, you're wondering, how can a God of love allow people to go to hell? Well, let me answer the question this way. First, God does not want men to perish. Heaven and hell are both 
personal choices that each individual makes while here on planet Earth. Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 8 lets us know that God provided for man's salvation through the work of his son on Calvary's cross. If men reject the Savior, they go to hell by their own choice. Someone said that God loves the sinners so much that if they choose to go to hell rather than heaven, he will let them go. Remember that they all go by their own choice. Second, 1 John 4 verse 8 teaches us that God is a God of love. He is the very essence of love. But 1 Peter 1.16 explains that he is also holy. He must punish sin. If he allowed sin to enter heaven, it would destroy all that God has done in redeeming mankind. Satan made his choice in the Garden of Eden. Man makes his choice during his lifetime. At death, man's eternal destiny has been determined. There is no purgatory or in-between place. There's no temporary holding pattern, hoping that you can somehow do enough time to make your way into heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible clearly teaches that there are only two places. As Matthew 25, 46 proclaims, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Third, men do not hesitate to put sick people in hospitals. People don't hesitate to put criminals in jails or corpses in the cemetery. This doesn't indicate a lack of love on their part. What about the heathen who have never heard the gospel? Well, like the rest of mankind, the heathen are lost sinners, and only Christ can save them. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and Psalm 19, verse 1, explain that they can tell that there is a God through the works of creation. Romans 2, 15 lets us know that they can also know there is a God through their own consciences. If they live up to the light which they have, God will give them more light. Such was the case with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Now, I'd like to use the remainder of our time in this lesson considering some of what the Bible has to say about future events. Every Bible student is thrilled to be able to read about events that are still future. Only in the Bible is the future unfolded. So let's consider some of these events in the order in which they will happen. The next event to occur on God's calendar is the coming of Christ to take his people home to heaven. This event, known as the rapture of the church, is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. That passage tells us that Christ will descend from heaven, the trumpet will sound, and the bodies of believers who have died will be raised. Then living believers will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. According to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58, the rapture will happen in the blinking of your eye, that quickly. This passage of scripture is the play-by-play -play account of this event. Read it slowly and carefully because it is about you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior today. And it may even happen today. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. Make note of that. Now, let's also consider the following facts about the coming of Christ. First, as Matthew 25, 13 teaches us, it may happen at any moment. We call that the imminent return of Christ. It can happen anytime. Second, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, lets us know that only those who are truly saved will participate in the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 explains that not all believers will die, but all will be changed. So there will be those alive that are raptured at that coming. And then 1 John 3, verses 2 through 7, and then Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 25, show us that we shall be like Christ. That is the transformation that will take place. Now, following the rapture, 
the world will be plunged into a seven-year period of judgment known as the tribulation. Now, the tribulation, that's a word that means trouble, troubling times. Matthew 24, verses 5 through 31, and much of the book of Revelation covers this period of time on earth. During this time, the earth will experience a period of great suffering and sorrow. And the Jewish people will return to the land of Palestine in unbelief. A great evil ruler will arise known as Antichrist, which means against Christ or opposed to Christ. Now, in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will convince the Jews that he is their friend and will seemingly work for their protection. Then in the middle of the seven years, he will turn on the Jews and reveal who he really is. He will demand worship from the people. He will deceive Israel. And then great persecution and battles such as have never been known in the history of the world are going to take place, culminating with that great battle described as the Battle of Armageddon. It will be a time of such great suffering, and unless the days are shortened, no life will survive. However, God will preserve those Jewish people who have been faithful to him. Reference to this can be found in many passages, including Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. There's also references in the book of Daniel. Now, at the end of the tribulation period, the Lord Jesus Christ along with those who were raptured, will come back with him to the earth in great power and glory and will reign with him. Christ will destroy his enemies, including Antichrist, and judge those nations which persecuted faithful Jews. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, we read that Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. In Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1, also in chapter 35, verses 1 through 7, and chapter 65, verses 17 through 25, the Bible teaches that when his work of judgment has been completed, Christ will set up his kingdom on the earth. Jerusalem will be his capital. He will reign upon the earth for a thousand years. And this period is known as the millennium. The word millennium literally means a 1,000-year period. It will be an era of peace and happiness. We read that nature will be entirely different at that point. The Bible tells us that the lion will lie down with the lamb. The desert will blossom like the rose. Men will live to very old ages, just like they did in the early days of creation. It will be a time of great prosperity. There will be no wars. Although sin will not be entirely absent, it will be punished immediately whenever it occurs. So we have the next event, the rapture of the church, followed by that seven-year period of tribulation, which will culminate in a great war, the Battle of Armageddon, judgment of the nations, and then the millennial kingdom of Christ will be established on earth. Next, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, we have the record of what is known as the judgment of the great white throne. This is different from the judgment of nations that we just talked about uh, prior to the millennial kingdom. This is the great white throne judgment. At the end of the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, the judgment of the great white throne will take place. This is the judgment of the wicked dead. There will be no saved persons involved in this judgment. Those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior will not face the great white throne judgment. The graves will give up the bodies of unbelievers, and Hades, or hell, will give up their souls. Then they will stand before Christ to be judged. The books will be opened, we are told, and all of their works will be judged. Finally, because their names are not found in the Lamb's book of life, they will be found guilty and sentenced to the lake of fire to suffer conscious and eternal punishment. Now, don't make any mistake about this. The fact that they are judged by their works, the, the books that are open, they are judged according to their works. Understand this. No works 
can ever measure up to God's perfect standard of holiness. The only work that measures up to God's standard is the work that Christ did on the cross by taking on our sins, dying sacrificially and substitutionally for us. So anyone depending upon their good works to get into heaven will always fall short. The ultimate judgment will be whether the name is found in the Lamb's book of life, those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and everyone at the great white throne will be sentenced to the lake of fire. There is no one who is going to make it in by their works. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, we find the final picture of the future, which is what we call the eternal state. The earth as we know it will have been destroyed by fire. Time as we know it will have ceased. All true believers will be enjoying endless happiness in heaven. All who have rejected the Savior will be suffering in the blackness of darkness forever. The ultimate question that faces each one of us and must be answered by each one of us as we come to the end of this lesson is where will we spend eternity? Will it be in eternity with the redeemed who have placed their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins? Or will it be in that everlasting place of torment which will be filled with those who have rejected Jesus? Now, if you're not certain where you will spend eternity, or if you know it will be in hell, and you want to change that, we invite you to visit our BBN chat ministry. There you can speak with someone about trusting Christ as your Savior. You can speak with them about being forgiven of your sins and securing heaven as your home for all eternity. Visit bbnchat.org, b-b-n-c-h-a-t dot o-r-g. Remember, the rapture can come at any moment. Once the church is taken away, then you are subject to the judgment of God. If we can be of help to you, please visit bbnchat.org right now. Well, that concludes our lesson on, for today on the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. I hope that you now have a better understanding of what the Bible teaches about future end-time events, what the Bible teaches about heaven and hell. Now, obviously, this has been an overview of a very detailed and extensive topic in the Scriptures. So as you have time, I'd invite you to prayerfully read through the Scripture references that we've shared. The study questions that you're about to answer will also help you to uh, solidify these truths in your thinking. Practical Christian living is the next area of study in our series. It will begin when you are ready to go on with Lesson 7. In the meantime, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that the future is indeed certain. You have already uh, determined beforehand what will happen. And we thank you, Father, that in that certainty you have made provision for us to escape judgment through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for those that are listening to this study today who do not know Christ as their Savior, have never placed their faith in Him. I pray today that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, may your Spirit move upon their hearts and draw them to yourself. For those of us who are believers in Christ, who have received the free gift of eternal life, Lord, may we rejoice in that gift today and may we be emboldened to share the good news of Christ with others. And so, Father, we ask that you will lend your blessing to this lesson and be honored in Jesus' name. Amen.